Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning here in the US and good afternoon uh, in Germany. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are um, having our webinar on legal challenges in current US legislation. Our brilliant speakers today will shine some light onto current laws and uh, acts that are relevant to German companies and their US, US operations. Um, the GACC South, as the organizer of the webinar, is partnering with the DAJV on this event, and uh, the event is sponsored by Andrew Myers. Thank you so much for your support for today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some um, housekeeping rules. Um, we please ask you kindly to uh, turn your cameras off and to mute yourself. Also, we will have um, Q&A sessions. Uh, we will have a long Q&A sessions, hopefully at the end of, um, of the session today, as well as uh, very brief uh, Q&A sessions at the end of each topic. Like this, we can address the questions immediately after each topic and move on to the next. As we are a very large number of particip participants today, I kindly ask you to uh, drop all your questions in the, in the chat function. And like this, I will be reading them out loud when we get to them. Also, uh, we will be sharing the presentations, uh, the presentation as well as the contact of the speakers uh, after the sessions with you, uh, feel free to reach out to them directly afterwards. Um, yeah, we have quite a big program um, ahead of us. So um, let's jump, jump right into it. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Wagner. I'm the customer relationship manager here in uh, Houston, Texas for the GACC South. Um, we have uh, a very vibrant business community here in Texas. We offer a lot of in-person events, as online events. And um, yeah, I'd like to invite you to uh, join our in-person events. The next ones will be uh, February 24th, our New Year's reception here in Houston, March 9th uh, in uh, Dallas. We will have our very first business conference uh, in May on May 19th here in Houston, our Southwest Business Conference. And I'd like also to invite you um, for a webinar that will be taking place uh, later on today at 11.30 Eastern Standard Time, um, which is our German-American um, business outlook, um, the results that came in from um, the survey that we did um, at the end of the year. This will be quite interesting. Um, I'd like to invite you to join this. I will be dropping the link um, in the um, chat in a minute. Um, as for uh, GSCC South, um, we uh, are the official representative of German trade and industry here in the US. And um, yeah, as you can tell, um, we are a wide ne network. We are five German American um, chambers across the US and we are part of a network of 140 German chambers abroad in 92 countries across the globe. Um, we um, support small and medium-sized companies with their US market entry and expansion. And uh, we, the GSCC South, we uh, cover 11 states that you can tell, um, uh, that you can see here, right here, everything from the Carolinas, Florida and Georgia up to Texas. So quite um, a big variety of states. And if you have any questions about the GSCC South or becoming a member, please feel free to reach out to me after the event. As mentioned, uh, GACC South is cooperating with DAJV on this event, and Andre from DAJV will take it from here and say a few words about um, DAJV. Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elisabeth. Um, also, a warm welcome from my side. My name is Andre Pantel. I'm Managing Director of DAJV. And I'm very happy that so many of you uh, are joining us today. Let me say a few words about our association for those who don't know DHEV yet. As you can see from the slide, we have a lot to offer transatlantically interested lawyers, including all ages and career levels. A selection of activities of our association are mentioned, uh, like, reg like regular meetings and conferences, regular lectures, discussion events, our transatlantic legal, blo legal block, an internship service for students and trainee lawyers, a mentoring program for, lawyer, uh, for young lawyers, and uh, a, the student division and the division for young professionals. So 
if this should have made you curious now, please contact us, please reach out to me, please re reach out to uh, our office in Bad Godesberg. Um, we uh, would appreciate that very much. With that, I would like to hand over back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Um, yeah, let's uh, jump right into it by introducing our uh, speakers of today. We have uh, uh, many, Manuel Schönhuber from Andrews Myers, uh, based here in Texas, uh, with me. Go, Texas! And uh, he's a native German and focuses his legal practice on counseling and representing German and other European companies in the US. He assists his client with all aspects of uh, market entry stage and acts as well as their outside uh, general counsel. Um, he has received his Juris Doctor from the University of Houston and his Bachelor in Management from St. Leo University in Florida. Uh, welcome, Manny. Thank you so much for uh, joining. Then we have as well Dr. Markus Ernst from New York. Welcome as well. Uh, he is admitted in New York as well as in Germany and to practice before the Supreme Court of the United States and the United States District Courts for the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York. He holds a very, a very uh, various uh, degrees from University of Bonn as well as the University of Regensburg as well as NYU. Very impressive. Um, his uh, legal practices uh, focuses on advising corporate entities and high net worth individuals in the US and Europe in corporate and commercial matters in uh, the United States. Um, yeah, welcome both of you. Thank you so much for your time. And um, let's get right into it. And I think, uh, Markus, you're taking it from here. Ah, no, actually, sorry, let me introduce the agenda to you. Um, uh, as uh, uh, described before, we will be covering those three topics, which is Build America, Buy America Act, and the infrastructure bill that um, Marcus will um, start off with. Then the very much discussed supply chain crisis with its Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, we will be covering today as well, and the employee vaccine mandates, which is obviously a very um, highly discussed topic in the news right now. So let's take it from here. Uh, Marcos, the floor is yours with the infrastructure bill. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're looking, as Elizabeth said, to legal challenges in current US legislation. So um, I want to start with the biggest legislative item so far passed under the Biden administration. It's the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. It's the largest spending bill in US history with $1.2 trillion over five years, which was enacted and signed in November last year. As the name says, it aims to improve US infrastructure, including roads, bridges, public transport, rail, drinking and wastewater, ports and airports, broadband, electric grid security, clean energy programs, for example, all US mail vehicles, shall become electric. The bill was also supported by Republicans in the Senate and the House, and therefore was able to pass. Part of, of that uh, large infrastructure bill is another act, Build America, Buy America Act. This is a continuation of the executive order President Biden signed right after he came into office in January 21, which was named, I quote, ensuring the future is made in all of America by all of America's workers. In that all order, Biden administration already directed uh, that all so-called made in America laws, which to some degree exist since the 1930s depression era, shall be strictly applied wherever possible and that any existing waivers and exemptions to such by America laws shall be reviewed. For this purpose, a specific office was, was created, the Made in America office, and um, it's um, to establish and create more transparency and scrutiny uh, with regard to any exceptions or waivers. And all exceptions and waivers have to be published on the website of that office. Uh, the Build America and Buy America bill and executive order do not only apply to the project under the infrastructure bill, but also modify the old already existing Made in America laws and make them more strict and exemptions more limited. De facto, this further closes the U.S. government procurement market for suppliers from the EU and other countries. 
So we go to the next slide. Uh, just in order to illustrate how strict the new rules are, um, just um, examples. In order to qualify uh, for steel and iron, uh, it has to be produced from melting of the ore to the coating in the United States. So uh, old practices like uh, producing the steel somewhere else and then reforming it, coating it in the US will not qualify anymore. Similar standards are expected to apply to common construction materials like lumber, drywall, glass, including fiberglass from broadband. Manufactured products means they have to be manufactured in the US. And in addition, the cost of domestic components must exceed 55% of the cost of all components and the 55% will go up to 75%. Um, there are certain waivers and exemptions possible. Uh, they fall into four categories. Uh, the first one is Biomerica is inconsistent with public interest. Um, the regulations are not out yet, but we believe that will be a very, very limited exemption. The second one is steel, iron, construction materials or products are not available in the United States or not available in necessary quantities. That could be a niche for some uh, foreign producers. Um, the third category is if the use of US products would increase the overall cost of the project by 25%. Um, and the fourth category is uh, where the application of the Buy American Act would be inconsistent with trade agreements. Uh, the US is signatory to the World Trade Organization's government procurement agreement. Generally, under the agreement, the US is barred to discriminate against foreign suppliers in government procurement contracts. However, not all projects, industries, and products fall under that agreement. So the US argues, for example, transportation, road and rail, as well as defense would not fall under this agreement anyway. In addition, exceptions from the GTO agreement are a project targeted to support small and medium local businesses, contracts under $250,000, and most importantly, individual states and municipalities for not under the WTO. Uh, so even if they receive federal funding, they would not be bound. Therefore, in order to compete, um, European and German companies should consider if they're not doing so yet, they should maybe start manufacturing in the US to fall under uh, uh, the rules. They may consider partnerships with federal contractors to supply them tools, machinery, and so forth, rather than to participate in the project itself. Um, the third category would be um, obtain waivers if you manufacture product which is not available in the US or from US manufacturers, or at least not in the quantity needed. Um, in addition to, to mention is the ownership of the company is not really important. It's important that the products are manufactured in the US by US workers. Um, I, I conclude that this bill is mostly a subsidy for US industry and US workers. And um, it will be hard um, to get into these projects. And now I'm open for questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Marcus, yes. Um, yes. Then we already have uh, one question. Is the exception for manufacturers products only? But the exception seems to be also for iron and steel. Is that something uh, you can talk about? The exception for iron and steel, it's, it's 
one exception would be if there is not enough iron and steel in the US. Um, it, it really depends like how fast this moves on, whether the US can manufacture enough steel or not. The US is pretty confident they can. The other one would be the 25% exception. And it's pretty sure that if there would be dumping pricing by other countries that the US would increase the tariffs on them so that it doesn't come to the threshold that um, uh, using US products would increase the price of the project by 25%. So as a steel manufacturer, I think that's kind of the, the worst position. Sorry, I hope Achim that is uh, answering your question. There's a follow-up question from him as well. Uh, so the exception applies to all three categories. Uh, yeah, the, the question is which exception? Um, not available in the US applies to all categories, um, whereby one must say the, the exact uh, uh, rules are not yet out by the government. So it's, they're still working on it. But generally speaking, if uh, products are not available in the US uh, or not available in enough quantity, you can can get a waiver. So like a German company just got one for a certain censoring instrument. Uh, there is an exemption for pens and stuff for workers clothing, which is not available in the US in, in the quantity. So. They're all kind of specialty products which may find a niche there. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, please drop them in our um, chat that we can uh, either ask now or as well, um, if there are further questions regarding this topic, we can ask them at the end as well. I do have a question, uh, Markus. Um, is Europe doing anything against the exclusion, exclusion of its companies from projects? under the current uh, infrastructure bill, in your opinion? Um, we don't exactly know what's going on in lobbying behind the curtain, but it would be late for that. So uh, we have not seen any complaints to the WTO yet. However, usually you would only file a complaint once uh, 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 a project was launched and uh, foreign manufacturers were rejected. So there's to be waited. It seems more from, from our research, the Europeans kind of start doing the same thing rather than trying to get access to the US market. They're also starting for government projects to, to limit uh, the bidders to domestic or European bidders. So it's, it's more like, uh, at least with respect to EU and the US that, that both kind of, uh, uh, go to, to subsidizing their own industries rather than opening it to each other. Okay, that uh, yeah, needs to be seen. Um, thank you so much. Uh, if we have no further questions at this point, uh, let's move on to the uh, next topic. Um, many will be talking about the supply chain crisis and its uh, legal implications. The floor is yours. Thanks, Elizabeth. And good morning, everybody in the US. Good afternoon, everyone in uh, Germany and Europe. And before I dive into this hot topic of supply chain issues that we're facing right now, or you may be facing right now, I will give a quick shout out to Elizabeth, Andre, and Marcos for putting all this together. Thank you very much. And we certainly hope you're enjoying this presentation. Um, although we are in, still in times of COVID and we have to do this remotely, with a video conference, I just imagine myself now being in the room full of people and asking the question whether you as a company or you as a lawyer know anybody with supply chain issues. And I just envision 80% of you would probably raise their hands and say, yes, right now, pretty much everyone is impacted with these supply chain issues that we're currently facing all over the world globally due to COVID and otherwise, uh, which is why I think it's very important that we address this. Now, when my clients call me or somebody else is asking me about supply chain issues, what should I be doing? How can I address it? 
the first question I always ask them is, what's your exposure profile? So that entails for you to check your contracts. Look at your contracts. What, do you, what does your contract say? What is really the exposure you're having? So that then also, and now you can see it on the slide, force majeure has become a big topic in the supply chain context. Force majeure is or could be an argument, could provide an argument that certain delivery obligations of suppliers should be suspended or extinguished due to events out of control. Now, two years after COVID started, the coronavirus pandemic certainly is no longer an unforeseeable event. Force majeure generally applies only to unforeseeable events, or as we call it sometimes in legal speak, an act of God that we simply could not foresee. And therefore, the performance under the contract is excused. So that's one thing I always uh, tell my clients to look at. Look at your contracts. What do your force majeure clauses say? Now, another important part is insurance. Look at your insurance policies. Talk to your insurance brokers. What's the exposure and what's the potential coverage that you can get from your insurance policy or even making a claim on the supplier's insurance policy? Those are certainly things and aspects that could help you with, with claims regarding to delay because of supply chain issues. Now, let's say the cause for delay is a fault of a third party. You're procuring from elsewhere. Your supplier, your direct supplier procures it from elsewhere. You're then in contact with your supplier and the supplier tells you, I simply cannot deliver on time or on budget. Now we got to have to look to the agreements with the third parties. Are there any redress? Is there any potential redress against the third party? Obviously, if the third party tells you, I don't have the good, I don't have the product, I can't do anything about it, then sure, you may not see the product ultimately being delivered to you. But at least you can ask for compensatory damages or, or other potential monetary recovery that you can see. So always be aware of the certain to-dos and the exposure profile. Now, what can you do to prevent certain things from happening? What can you do to protect your rights against third parties or your suppliers? Always inform your customer about potential delays as soon as possible. And here's the kicker in writing. Everything should be in writing, whether it's an email, whether it's other um, demand letters, communications, correspondence to that effect. Put everything in writing because the courts, at least in the US, will consider this. Also, take a look at the due diligence that you're doing with your customers, with the supplier, because supplier bankruptcies have been on the rise. And we all know in bankruptcy courts, the ultimate recovery is only a percentage of what you may be owed. Or if you're waiting for some product, you're probably never going to see that product. So determine their financial health beforehand. And how, how can you do that? Well, for your customers, for example, demand a letter of credit or get a personal or parent company guarantees. So that way, at least you have additional paths to ultimate recovery. Now, another interesting point would be to look at when passage of title actually happens. Let's say you have a manufactured good or product. When does it become your property when not maybe not when it's in your possession maybe not when it's delivered maybe you can already agree to passage of title at the point of manufacturing so those are all certain things that you can do beforehand in order to protect yourself first against re potential recovery from third parties second 
to actually get the good or material delivered on time and hopefully on budget. And third, um, to also protect your rights in a US court, should you be, or in an arbitration for that matter, um, in case you had to seek to enforce your rights. Now, a little more nuanced topic is the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. And I simply can't help myself because it's such a lovely word to say it in German, the Lieferketten sorg Pflichtengesetz. So it probably won't get any more German than that. And uh, for legal speak, um, very interesting just to mention that. Now, the I'm going to stick with the English word there. The Supply Chain Due Diligence Act was adopted by the German federal parliament on June 11, 2021. But you're going to have some time to get used to it and to prepare for it. It's not going to enter into force until January 1st of 2023. So now is the time to look at what this actually means, what potential implication this may have, not only for German companies located in Germany, but also German companies with US subsidiaries or international subsidiaries for that matter. The goal as stated by the German parliament or the German government is to improve the protection of international human rights and the environment by setting binding standards for large companies and their value chains. Now, what do they mean by human rights? Obviously that includes modern day slavery, forced labor, human trafficking, hazardous work and exploitation. So the general protections human rights entail. The environment, those aspects fall under three conventions. The first is the Stockholm Convention, which relates to persistent organic pollutants. The Minamata Convention, which, is, uh, which deals with mercury emissions and the Basel Conventions uh, relating to transboundary movements of hazardous waste and disposal. For example, if you have trash in Germany and that is being exported to other countries um, that will fall under the, the Basel Convention. Now, the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act may not initially apply to you if you don't have 3,000 or more employees globally. But after January 1st, 2024, it actually may apply to you if you have more than 1,000 employees globally. Um, because the important aspect is that all employees, even the ones posted abroad, for example, like the US, are included for German companies. And the German company is defined as a company that has either central administration, its principal place of business, administrative headquarters, a registered seat, or branch office in Germany. So that pretty much includes all companies that either have a presence in Germany or actively do business in Germany. Um, not only US subsidiaries with a German parent company. The due diligence obligations reach only to direct suppliers, not indirect suppliers. So here, as compared to the first slide I talked to you about, we're not looking at any third parties that your actual supplier may get products, services, goods from. We're only looking at your direct supplier, which is most of the time the party that you have a written agreement with your contracting party on the other side. For indirect suppliers, this is where it gets a little vague yet. Maybe there will be more clarification on that, but you as a company have to carry out a risk analysis if you have proven knowledge of human rights violations. Now, what does this mean? Obviously, if there's a company, a supplier of your a third party to your supplier, where we know it's all over the news that there are some human rights issues, then you have proven knowledge. But again, there may come some further clarification from the government on that aspect. Now the act introduces possibility, the possibility to assert rights before German courts through trade unions and NGOs. That means 
a trade union or non-governmental organization can go to a German court and seek to enforce the act against the company because of due diligence violations abroad. Possible fines, again, still not 100% clear. This may change until um, the act enters into force, but it can lead to a temporary exclusion from public procurement and a fine of $175,000 or more, depending on the size of your company. And here is uh, an aspect that has been subject to a lot of criticism uh, from NGOs and trade unions. The companies that violate the act are not civilly liable. So again, there may be some additional um, liability aspect developed over the years until the act goes into effect due to the criticism the government has received because of it. But as of now, a company that violates the act is not, cannot be civilly liable other than the fines and the temporary exclusion from public procurement. That has been um, stated so far. Another supply chain consideration uh, that I wanted to point out in this context is the FCPA and the entity list. Some of you may have already heard about the FCPA, which is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. There are true two provisions in the FCPA, the anti-bribery and the accounting provisions. For purposes of this discussion, I only focus on the anti-bribery provision because let's assume you're a company and you have to procure goods during the current supply chain crisis. Now, the only option you have is to pay somebody off in order to procure the good from elsewhere. Now, on the US law, you cannot do that because it generally prohibits US persons and businesses from making corrupt payments to foreign officials to obtain or retain business. And this is important inside and outside the US. So you cannot go abroad to a country, to the government or a governmental official and say, I need these goods. I'm going to pay you personally a lot of money so that you ship these goods directly to me. No, you cannot do that. You cannot do that either inside or outside the US. The second aspect is the entity list as proclaimed by the US Export Administration regulations. So the entity list has, generally speaking, two lists set up of companies or individuals that are either blacklisted or graylisted um, by the US government. And this entity list includes persons, legal or natural, including businesses, individuals, governments, research institutes, and private organizations that have engaged in activities contrary to US national security and or foreign policy interests. Again, most of those individuals or businesses could also be included under the FCPA, very similar restrictions, very similar heritage, very similar doing business aspects um, that fall under. And the entity list is widely available. You can find it on the internet and you can look into who can I not do business with or who can I do business with in case I get a license to do business with them. And this is essentially what needs to happen for you to do business with someone who may be listed on the entity list. Otherwise, there's a threat of civil and criminal liability. If a company like yours sells or even procures from a listed entity without proper licensing. And now I'll open up the floor for any questions that you have relating to the supply chain crisis. Uh, thank you, Manny, uh, for this uh, certainly very insightful and quite uh, action-packed topic. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? If so, please uh, drop them in the chat function. In the meantime, Manny, I have a question because uh, obviously you mentioned yourself that um, the supply chain due diligence law is actually not civilly liable. So, you know, in consequence, I'm asking myself, 
does it really have you know teeth can it can it actually stand um if if it is not liable so like would company just see this as a you know kind of yeah i mean what do i care so good question i think the main harm is the potential reputational harm what the german company is currently looking at because once a company is facing a lawsuit through an NGO or uh, yeah, other trade associations or, or uh, employee right, right groups in German court. And your company is being sued in German court. Obviously, that's public knowledge. So the overall intent of the German company with the, I want to say it again, Lieferketten Sorgfaltspflichtgesetz, Pflichtengesetz, is for this not to even happen in the first instance. So right now they're giving companies enough time to become familiar with this aspect, with this act. And then once it actually uh, enters into force in uh, 2023, they want you to have any right uh, or any chance to prepare yourself for it. And uh, then hopefully not be dragged into a court of law and having to defend it and fear your reputational harm, because ultimately that could mean that you're doing business with a supplier that is violating international human rights or environmental protection uh, conventions. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I certainly think it, it will be difficult to you know, for a lot of companies, because as well, you could argue that, um, how did you know, like, how would you know, you know, um, in your whole supply chain. But um, yeah, um, another question uh, I would have is, um, it is still for companies, you said, I think, starting with uh, next year for companies above 3000 um, employees, and then I think the year after 1000 employees. Um, that certainly doesn't cover, um, you know, a lot of, for example, Mittelstands companies. So there is still, so to say, like a legal loophole um, in your, you know, uh, experience, in your, um, in your opinion, do you think that um, a lot of German Mittelstands companies might still want to follow this just, as you said, for the reputation, uh, for reasons of reputation, or what do you expect? Uh, absolutely. I think it's uh, simply good business practice, knowing that the act exists, that the law exists that you, even if you don't, do not meet the 1,000 employee mark yet, or maybe will never meet it, that it's simply good business practice to still follow it and that you're compliant with it because that's um, great for marketing, right? And great to be able to show your suppliers and simply from a legal perspective, it's always better to, to dot all your I's, cr cross all your T's uh, in, in order to comply with a law that maybe in the future may change again to only 500 employees, only 100 employees. You never know uh, how it will develop. But as of right now, I think it would be good business practice to still comply with it. And that would also be my advice to my client. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, we have another question um, from the audience. Um, there, there may be a civil liability for a producer selling to a manufacturer under paragraph 826 BGB, if the producer violates the supply chain obligation and his in this harms and also the manufacturer, although the latter may have contributory negligence. Thank you for that additional insight. Yeah. Great. Um, any other questions at this point? Otherwise, I'm sure we'll um, have more time at the end to um, address further questions. Yes, then let's move on to a very much discussed uh, and all over the news um, topic, which is the employee vaccine uh, mandate. Our speakers will shed some light onto you know the practices and you know the current um, developments, as we just had something in the news um, yeah last week. Um, I think uh, Marcos, you will take it away from here. Uh, we wanted to do it together, kind of. So I think many wanted to do the Supreme Court. Yes, that, that's fine with me. So um, 
as you may have heard, the Supreme Court fairly recently stopped the requirement that employees at large businesses, which means a hundred or more employees, get vaccine or have to get the vaccine for the COVID, uh, for COVID, uh, or test regularly and wear a mask on the job. So the Supreme Court struck this federal mandate down and opined that although OSHA is empower, empowered to set workplace safety standards, they're not empowered to set broad public health measures. Um, this is, I would say, I would call it, and Marcus, if you disagree with me, please uh, enlighten everybody. I think this is a preliminary holding. There will be more uh, discussions on this topic, also from the Supreme Court, because there are other cases still pending in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which includes Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee. So there may be more to come, and this may still not be the, the, the end of the road, um, but at least for federal employee, um, for the employees of companies of 100 or more employees um, do not have to comply with this. However, the Supreme Court did allow a vaccine mandate for most healthcare workers in the US. That's different. That does not include employees at large businesses. This only includes healthcare workers in the US. But, and this is very recent, as of last Friday, a judge in Galveston here in Texas struck down this federal vaccine mandate for healthcare workers, saying that the Biden administration cannot enforce its vaccine mandate for federal employees. And the injunction the court signed halts the requirement nationwide. So not only in Texas, but nationwide, because the judge is a federal judge. And again, there's an appeal pending. There may be more to come, but as of right now, the federal vaccine mandates are still in development, is I guess what I would say. And as you know, and Marcus, I'll hand it over to you on that. There are various forms of vaccine mandates in different states and localities that apply differently than the overall federal vaccine mandates. Yeah, thank you, Manny. Um, Generally speaking, uh, the Biden administration tried like in three ways to 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 order a vaccine mandate. One was uh, uh, the plus 100 employees for companies to have a vaccine mandate that was struck down. The medical workers that is uphold, and also all federal employees uh, were supposed to get vaccinated, and there are also lawsuits against that pending. Uh, Besides the federal mandate, uh, some states uh, uh, try to, to uh, enact the vaccine mandate. Others do not want to do that. Uh, so New York as a blue state, we have a, a vaccine mandate for healthcare workers. Uh, we have um, uh, the order to wear masks in public places in New York state. Uh, if you go to shopping, to restaurants, to theaters, uh, all inside public places, you are supposed to wear a mask. Uh, interestingly, uh, about 10 counties out of uh, about 35 already said their police force will not enforce that mandate, uh, contrary to the orders of the governor. And um, the state does not have the enforcement uh, 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 staff. So um, like even in New York, it's, it's debated between uh, uh, the counties and the state. New York City has probably the, the strongest. You can only go to, to a restaurant if you're vaccinated. Um, all employers have to uh, uh, look out for uh, their workers to be vaccinated as soon as there's more than one person in one office. Uh, Non-vaccinated workers have to be tested. They have to wear masks. Uh, so New York State and New York City are very strong in trying to uh, make the people get vaccinated, order them to get vaccinated or wear masks. 
And um, now Manny is kind of telling us about the opposite kind of state attitude in Texas. Yes, so as many of you know, Texas is a Republican state, similar to a lot of states governed by Republicans, um, most of them in the South of the US. I can keep it short and sweet. There is no mandate for vaccine. There's only the opportunity for an employer to require it as a condition of employee employment. Because Texas, for example, is an at-will state, which uh, likes the higher and fire mentality. I'm gonna put it this way. Um, so a Texas employer can also, here's the carve out to this, not impose a vaccine mandate on an employee who qualifies for an exemption based on religious, personal, or medical reasons. That's even a further carve out to the condition of employment requirement. And last but not least, in Texas, there's no city specific mandate because uh, Governor Abbott in an executive order banned those very early on. So whether you're in Austin, Dallas, Houston, or elsewhere in Texas, the county or city cannot require mandates or cannot um, impose mandates on uh, employers or employees for that matter. Uh, thank you so much for that overview. Um, we know there is uh, a lot of movement in that area. Um, in, in, it has been in the past uh, weeks and uh, potentially in the next uh, few weeks. Um, we have a question. Um, what is the reasoning behind the Texas court's decision to halt vaccine mandates for healthcare workers? So um, I will add to that that Judge Brown, who struck down the uh, mandate, was appointed by President Trump at the time. So he has a very strong opinion about uh, the liberty of individuals uh, to make their own decisions, the whole freedom argument, right? So what the judge, in his opinion, actually said that the president cannot, and here I quote, with the stroke of a pen or without getting Congress involved, uh, require millions of uh, federal or employees to undergo some kind of medical procedure, which the vaccine under his interpretation will be a, a medical procedure as a condition of employment. So um, I'm not sure that argument will fly in the Court of Appeals, but as of right now, the individual freedom argument at, based on the Supreme Court's decision uh, overall, uh, which the judge cited to, um, that's how the injunction got granted, but to be determined uh, if it will stand. I mean, dare I ask, um, in your legal expertise, what, like both of you, what are you expecting to, to be happening? What's the end game here? Like, is that even possible to foresee, like, legally? Marcus. Or no? <laughs> yeah, I, I think be, because we have a different Supreme Court uh, now than we had, like, uh, five years ago, um, I believe the Supreme Court, uh, who is more conservative, will struck down uh, if it's too broad, if there is no kind of immediate relationship as we had with the medical workers, uh, that they kind of care of older people and so forth. So there is an actual risk. Uh, somebody who is working for the federal government, uh, looking at the roads and stuff, uh, I think the Supreme Court would stay away from having mandatory vaccines on these people. So I think we have to, to see that the judges are judges, but they are politically appointed. So we have a conservative Supreme Court. So my best guess would be, but as you said, it's probably not foreseeable, would be that uh, very limited as we uh, saw, saw now, uh, which upheld the healthcare worker um, mandate uh, uh, by the Supreme Court. We will see things like that, but a general federal vaccine mandate would not be possible with the Supreme Court. And I would agree with that. I think the most optimistic outcome would be that the Supreme Court kicks it back to the states and let the states decide what they want to do. 
But I agree with Marcus. I don't think there will be a federal vaccine mandate, if at all. The judges will let the states decide what they want to do locally and then let them do so. But federal uh, is highly unlikely, in my opinion. Yeah. Or it but will be fought yeah, no, in the courts until, until the next virus happens. No, and the Supreme Court seems to have a tendency to, to actually do that and, and put it back to the states. New York, there was a, a, a New York uh, um, appeal to the Supreme Court uh, with regard to religious exemptions for vaccine mandate in New York State, and the Supreme Court didn't take it. The Supreme Court said, you have to deal with your state on that. So um, they might try to get out of having to decide it by just uh, throwing it back to the state court. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly uh, an easier way and uh, obviously the responsibility of each state and then it sounds like it will, uh, you know, end up being, you know, if it's a red or a blue state and uh, that will be the influence on the local decisions. Um, then, um, if we have at this point no further question about the employee vaccine mandate, um, I want to just generally open up the room if there have uh, if there are any other questions that you'd like to address, anything that we haven't covered that you think uh, is really, really interesting, please drop your questions um, right now. If there are no questions, then I feel like we've uh, done our job and uh, you know informed as as far as we can tell um, about the those the those uh, three topics that are I think quite uh, quite large. And um, if there are no questions, um, Marcus, not many. Any other um, topics? Yeah, maybe. That you Maybe I can, can add to the vaccine mandate and employment law, many kind of touch uh, based on that. Um, generally speaking, you have to look at your local laws where your company in the US is, but uh, in most cases, an employer can actually require uh, uh, the uh, employees to be vaccinated with certain religious and medical exemptions, depending on in which state you are. In New York, the religious exemption does not uh, apply, but uh, it's not only what the government mandates, but you can, if you are concerned about the health of your employees, you can order people to either be vaccinated or maybe alternative vaccinated and tested uh, uh, in short order and so forth. So. Um, um, there's most states are at will states and you can actually somebody who refuses to uh, get vaccinated in your overall concern for the other employees terminate these people. One aspect and thanks for bringing that up Marcus I could also add to that is uh, what I have seen done here in Texas is for example you have a super essential worker um, who for whatever reason cannot get vaccinated, but you still make the uh, vaccination a condition of employment. What we have seen is um, that instead of being a full-time employee, that employee becomes a 1099 independent contractor. You enter into an independent contractor agreement. Obviously the employer, uh, the employee can no longer be present at the office but again you can at least get around and if there's work from home opportunities for that employee um, you can so to speak enter into a independent into an independent contractor agreement with that employer employee and still get the job done that needs to be done by that essential employee Um, many thanks. Um, I think at this point, uh, we have no further questions. I'd like to, um, you know, thank each and every one of you for joining. I want to thank especially our speakers and uh, Manny and, uh, and uh, Marcus uh, for joining. Thank you for your time. Um, really appreciate it. All the valuable um, impact. And um, uh, as well, DRJV, thank you so much for cooperating on this event. Here you have the speaker contacts uh, of Manny in Houston and uh, Marcus in New York. 
And um, thank you again for joining. We invite you to subscribe to our newsletter uh, of the GACC South for future events in person and as well online. I hope to meet you all at some point uh, in the future online or in person. Thank you so much. Feel free to contact us for any questions and we will be sharing the presentation after the event. Thank you so much again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.